Hello, students. I am, um, I'm in Paris, actually. No, <laughs> I'm in Paris. And Rudy Ramirez on uh, here on this side um, is a, a wonderful local theater director. And we're going to talk to him. I'm going to talk with, with, um, with you about the Futurex that's coming to town. And I, um, I think I'd like to start with just your, a simple introduction as to who you are, your gender pronouns, which I um, uh, would love for you to maybe explain a little bit of that to my students, because I think that that's important information for the future decks as well. And um, uh, yeah, and a little bit about your history. I, I prefer you to say it all rather than me, because I, I um, will inevitably skip something that's probably more important and pertinent to you. So welcome, Mr. Rudy Ramirez. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, so um, my name is Rudy Ramirez and my pronouns are they, them. Um, I identify as non-binary and have for about uh, going on a year now, I think. Um, and, uh, and, you know, to me that is about saying that, you know, neither the term man nor woman, male nor female feel like they particularly fit. Um, and so, uh trying to stand outside of that binary which like i've done i think for most of my life but i think that now it's more about like actually naming it um and and that's uh, the reason also why one of the reasons why uh Futurex is Futurex. um so um as many people might know um over the past few years in the united states uh the word latinx has kind of replaced latino as uh the dominant uh, term for people of Latin American descent. And everything I say needs to be, have like 500 caveats in front of it. Like, <laughs> um, there, there are so many, like the, 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 the debates over what we should call ourselves are huge and, um, and, and complicated. And every time like a new term is proposed, you know, people are like, oh, let's use that one. It's like, well, but there's so much to unpack about all of them, you know, so. <laughs> Um, for those who may not know, the Spanish language uh, tends to gender uh, itself a lot. And the idea is that, you know, if you have that Latino is masculine, but um, Latino was like being used as, as sort of also like it, covering both men and women, um, but with male dominance. All right. And that's something in part of the Spanish language, a lot of other languages is that like you have when if you if you have, you know, 500 women and one man, it's still Latinos, not Latinas, because that one man's gender overrides all the others. So Latinx sort of started appearing as a way of incorporating um, men, women, and gender nonconforming folk. Now, there are some folk who say that Latinx should just be used by people who are gender nonconforming. Uh, there are some folks who think that Latinx is too American and too English, and we should use Latinez or something like that. There's a lot of folks who think that any kind of attempt to summarize uh, a bunch of and generalize a bunch of tremendously different experiences based on nation and um, indigenous community and African communities and all these all, and and the mixture of all these things in all the different ways that happen in all the different countries and all the different communities all over Latin America is is. Uh, a fool's errand. And so uh, they say we shouldn't use a term at all. And so um, so naming something a Latinx performance festival is very fraught. Uh, but I wanted to do it and I wanted to call it Futurex because um, I, I am a sci-fi geek, uh, first and foremost. Uh, and uh, and I love that, and I, I have seen very little um, Latinx sci-fi, and whenever I do, I get very, very excited about it. Um, I'm also an experimental theater artist, um, and I really love experimental and avant-garde theater, and uh, tried to do it uh, as much as I could at the Vortex, which is uh, my artistic home uh, here in Austin. And uh, I wanted to create a festival uh, for Latinx artists, artists to explore their ideas of the futurity of Latinidad, of what Latinidad is going to look like in the 21st century and beyond. All right. So, um, and and with the Futurex, I wanted to emphasize that I think that the future of Latinidad is in queerness, it's in feminism, it's in Afro-Latinx identity, it's in Indigenous identity, it's in uh, identity, ex explorations of identity that reject both 
sort of an assimilationist model of like, well, we should get to the mainstream and embrace it and, you know, and, and go from there. And uh, the traditionalist, which is that we should preserve all these older models of identity. Um, and I said, I think there's something that is neither of those things that I want to explore with this festival. Great. So um, just fantastic. I want to um, cue my students a little bit. So um, uh, this festival begins when? So we should let them know because uh, that's important. Mm -hmm. And where? Um, so this festival will be entirely online because we are in COVID times. Um, and you can go to the Vortex uh, website uh, and look up Futurex. I think it's vortexrep.org slash Futurex, or I think that's it. I should look it up, right? Um, and um, I will send them all links, but I, um, I guess one of the things that I would love for you to explain a little bit is uh, the kinds of work that had happened in the past and the artists that that came because it wasn't just the festival. There were also lectures and there were conversations um, uh, with people that were, uh, you know, around these topics, right? And talking and speaking around about and with these topics in mind. Um, so maybe a little bit about the history of the festival. Um, as artistically, right? Sure, sure. Also, before I forget, also, we, yes. we, we start November 6th, and we run the 6th and 7th, Friday and Saturday, the um, 13th and 14th, Friday and Saturday, and the 20th, 21st, Friday and Saturday, all online. Uh, okay. So, so the history of the festival, um, so this began in many ways because there was city funding available for a festival. Um, and uh, you know that was brought up at a Vortex meeting. And I said, well, I actually have an idea. Uh, because uh, we were working on uh, the first production of a piece called Undocuments by Jesus I, Jesus I Valles, and they are um, another non-binary uh, Latinx artist at the Vortex, an amazing performer and poet. And uh, we were developing uh, their work, uh, Undocuments, which was about their experience um, coming to the United States undocumented, getting citizenship, and then uh, having their brother deported back to Mexico uh, and sort of what this um, exposes about the nature of citizenship and the nature of borders. And so uh, Jesus's work is performance poetry. And I really, I wanted to, you know, have this be the centerpiece of a festival showcasing Latinx work. Uh, and so um, I reached out to various people I knew um, we had a um, an improv group called Latinots, um, and they were um, a group of Latinx improv artists who created a piece that was sort of like um, a, a, a comedy set on a starship. So if you ever see the TV show The Orville, it's very much like that. Um, uh, but it was all Latinx characters, you know. And the first time I saw them, you know, I, I knew a couple of people who were involved in it, and um, I, I was excited about the concept, you know, and it starts and it's really funny. And then at the end of the first scene, you know, they had that moment where they're like, all right, you know, like report to your stations, be back here at 1800 hours, you know? And then as they're all leaving, they all start hugging and kissing each other goodbye. And as much as I was laughing in that moment, because that's what Mexican families always do when we say <laughs> goodbye to each other, um, I also almost started crying. Uh, because that was the first time I realized, I was like, this is the first time I've seen Latinx culture mm. in the future. Like mm. occasionally, mm. occasionally you will see Latinx actors. Like I realized like, you know, you had like, you had two Latinx actors on Star Trek Voyager. I'm a huge Trekkie, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but you know- one And in the Star uh, Battleship, uh, Battleship uh, Galactica, right? The, yeah. the remake, right? Well, so you had like Edward James almost in that one. Uh huh. But the thing is, it's like, but in Battlestar, they're not playing Earth humans. So it's right. like, they're not, you know. Right. Um, and then um, in Star Trek Voyager, like one of them was playing a Native American and one of them was playing um, a half Klingon, half Latina character. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so this was the first time there was more than one character and that like our culture was being performed in a futuristic setting. And I was like, oh my God, we survived. Um, because mm, sometimes, mm. Uh, particularly in this day and age, uh, and so, mm -hmm. um, 
so uh, I, I mean, I reached out to um, local folks like Florinda Bryant, who's an amazing uh, performer, um, writer, and poet, and director, and all around. Um, uh, Dylan Iruegas was a trans uh, performer, director, writer uh, here in, uh, then in Austin, now in Boston. Um, Heather Maria Osh, who's a New York based uh, filmmaker, burlesque performer. Um, uh, Victor Casares, who's based in Portland and is a, a filmmaker and playwright who does incredible work. Um, and we did readings of plays and we invited folks to speak as well, including um, the Indigenous Cultures Institute uh, in San Marcos. We invited Maria Rocha and Dr. Mario Garza. And their talk was really transformative for us because they spoke about, you know, they're, they're interested in the idea of decolonizing Latinidad. And decolonizing Latinidad means acknowledging that um, many people, if not most people of Latinx heritage in the United States, certainly of, of um, Mexican and Central American heritage, um, are of indigenous ancestry. And a lot of our indigenous ancestry has been um, co-opted by nationalist projects, buried by centuries of colonialism. And they're saying that, you know, that, that it is vitally necessary for um, Latinx people to understand themselves as indigenous. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, the, the, the history they gave us, I mean, we were all so, you know, we were shook to the core, you know, by some of the things they were saying, like, um, uh, they talked about um, how uh, Mirabeau Lamar, uh, who Lamar Boulevard is named after, um, he ordered the expulsion or execution of all Native Americans from the Republic of Texas. Mm. Um, and um, so a lot of uh, Native Americans started identifying as Mexican in order to be allowed to remain in the Republic mm. um, before it became a state. Um, and knowing that my own father's family was was in Mexico when it was the Republic. I mean, it was was in was in Austin, the Austin area, when it was the Republic of Texas and Mexico. I was like, that could be them. Um, certainly, people in my father's family look extremely indigenous. Um, you know, and uh, you know, uh, content warning, sexual assault. For this next bit. Um, you know, th there's the Mexican swear word. You know, like chingar to fuck. You know, like and it's. it's and you say chingada, they say chingada all the time. But what they told us, which we never understood, is that that came from the Nahuatl word for rape. Mm, mm, mm. And it was so telling that the, the colonized people's word for rape became the colonizer's word for fuck. Um, and that really, I stopped using it, certainly anywhere near as much as I used to. Um, because I was just like, I, I was like, that's, that's such a, a chilling story and language that we'd forgotten. And so I, that it was, it was really powerful to think about how in order to understand our future, we have to understand our past. We have to understand colonization and its effects and the ways we don't even see sometimes how they're still in operation. And so creating a festival like um, FutureX is a means for, well, I'm going to frame this into a question. In what ways can a festival, like a theater festival, right, arts, um, contribute, assist, propel, inspire uh, this decolonization process, you know? I think one of the biggest things that we do for ourselves and one another is like the, the, the very nature of festival format means that you're putting these pieces in conversation with one another. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you are, are sort of showing different takes on what Latinidad means uh, because that, that, that take from the Indigenous Culture Institute, I mean, it's, it's one that, that as important as it is, I think it also does some erasure of African um, Latinx roots, you know? Um, and so I, you know, so I think it's important to include Afro Latinx perspectives as well, um, you know, because this is, there, there's, there's so much of that in our culture um, in various different ways. Uh, and so what, what this allows people to do is to watch one another's work and get inspired, you know, and to connect with one another and to start 
thinking, all right, who are, who are future collaborators who I can have? Um, what is someone doing in their art that makes me want to tell my own story? Mm, mm. Um, you know, and that's something that I found a lot is that there were people, you know, who talk about what they saw the previous year at Futurex, inspiring what they're doing this year at Futurex, um, because they, you know, saw expressions of the self that they had not been used to seeing. Right, right. Um, this is the third year, correct, for mm -hmm. this festival. Um, and have you seen the festival grow? Have you seen it grow, not like locally, but also has it been getting attention through the, the various vines and the theater networks? Um, I would say that like, we're not as much attention as I would like. Um, I like a lot mm -hmm. of attention. Um, but, um, but what I will say is that like, it's interesting because, you know, the first year was very small. Mm -hmm. Year I think was in some ways too big. Um, I think we had so many things that we wanted to put in there that um, it kind of felt a little sprawling and all over the place. Um, but at that point we did get coverage in Texas Monthly, which was really, really great. Um, and then this year, um, because of it this being an online festival, we're trying to market it not just to Austin folks, but to people interested in Latinx theater all over the country. Or the globe. <laughs> yeah, exactly, all over the globe. Right. And, um, you know, just to be super boring and practical for my students so that they understand that there are artists involved, but there's business involved and decisions for a festival um, take kind of a different, there's a different process um, for something like a festival, which includes dozens, if not hundreds of artists at play. At what point did you realize this festival was going to go forward digitally and how far do you have to plan for such things again you know i'm i'm speaking to introduction to theater students right theater appreciation students and i like to give them a holistic sense that it's not just being creative geniuses in in a in a, in a room but there's a lot of hard decisions that have to be made in the process right well i mean i think the first thing that needs to be talked about and said with this with any theater festival, uh, particularly with happening right now, is that um, you know I had no intention in any at any point of doing a festival where people are just doing it for the love of the art. I want them to get paid. Um, I want my artists to get paid. This is important. <laughs> um, and uh, I have been like so. The first year, you know, we had funding for the show and some funding for the festival. But then the second year, um, I was told by the Vortex that I would uh, have to raise the money entirely on my own um, to make this festival happen. Um, and so I said, all right, like, the, well, I was actually told, like, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have to cancel it because we don't necessarily have the money for it. I'm like, well, what if I raise the money for myself? And they're like, well, if you do that, then we'll do it. And uh, I figured I had to raise, I think, um, ten thousand dollars to make it happen, um, and I raised more than sixteen. Um, and so uh, I was quite pleased with myself on that one. Um, did you? Was that mostly through personal, um, like private donations, or did you get some grant money and some funding from other sources? So there was some grant money, um, but that wasn't counted toward the fifteen thousand. Um, I see. Uh, that was. Um, no, what we what we were able to do was this is I partnered with Raul Garza um, with at TKO Advertising, and he's been a godsend in terms of helping us connect with funders. Um, but you know, I reached out to um, so like he'll have you know like he reaches out to a lot of private companies and corporations who he works with um, who want to sponsor that the next art, you know, and um, but then also things like um, reaching out to UT. Um, to uh we we wound up this 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 past year and then this year again getting co-funding from teatro vivo um which is a a bilingual theater company here in town mm -hmm. um they do amazing work um and um uh i remember c3 events which did um austin city limits um and still do i assume um they have sponsored us last year to the tune of a good chunk of money um and uh and uh let's see but yeah, so it was really a blend of so, like some individuals, some companies, 
and some organizations like UT and also Fusebox Festival uh, donated both uh, last year and this year, um, like larger um, nonprofit organizations who have funding set aside to help um, Latinx art organizations. Uh, and so, you know, it was uh, the the size of the festival this year was absolutely dictated by like how much do I think it can raise in a way that feels like I can give artists money that feels acceptable to me mm. uh, to offer, you know? Um, and uh, so like I'm offering folks, folks basically like 50 bucks per night for an, a like half hour performance. Um, That's all digital and without the need for paying for a space, I would assume, right? right? Exactly. exactly. No overhead, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, there will be, so um, Prefa Teatro will be doing a show just the final weekend. Um, they're, a, they're a Spanish language theater company here in Austin. They'll be using the Vortex space uh, to do some stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but overall, we will be, um, it'll be entirely presented online. There'll be no like in-person performances um, because of the nature of the pandemic. So um, the funny thing is that I think that having it be virtual in some ways makes it a lot easier for folks to participate, um, you know, and to, and particularly if they're coming in from other places. And a lot of the work I'm presenting is pre-recorded work, um, you know, just so that they'll be able to like access on the website um, during this time. And uh, as well as some live performance from uh, various artists. Um, so I have uh, like a lot of local folks coming back again, folks like um, Ben Bazan, Lily Lopez, Jesus Valles, um, Marina de Dio Pedraza, um, Olivia Jimenez and Eva McQuaid are doing performance together. Um, then uh, uh, Lee Gonzalez is a local uh, DJ who's doing sort of a DJing performance on trans identity. Um, then there's a filmmaker who I got to meet from Los Angeles and an act actress named Nava Mao who is uh, trans Latina um, and we're showing a short film that she made. Um, we've got a Afro Latina performer from uh, from New York uh, doing ritual theater, ritual magic performance. Um, we have uh, a podcast from LA. We have a uh, theater group from Philadelphia, you know, so it feels much more like a, a national event. It's great. Than, than in previous years. Yeah, I mean, that's the one thing that COVID's been doing for all of us theater makers. It's like, oh, oh, let's, let's uh, go national with a lot of this work. Yep. It's, it's really great because we're meeting different artists from across the country. Um, uh, uh, yes. Um, I, 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 uh, I, I feel like I want to wind this up down because, um, you know, time is precious and I don't want to, um, <laughs> I want students to get what they need in the time that uh, we have. But I also wanted to congratulate you because you've had a couple of pretty amazing things happen in the last year. Um, uh, you were accepted into an MFA program at um, University of Mass uh, yep. Massachusetts, right? Yeah, University of Massachusetts, Amherst. At Amherst, which is amazing. So congratulations on it. And my students, you know, a, a master's of fine arts means that that's a, the highest you can get in the in that particular field for uh, uh, as an artist. So it's really, really amazing. So Rudy here is trying to figure out how to <laughs> do um, um, a degree program in directing during COVID. So that in of itself is going to create some resilient <laughs> um, innovation. Um, but the other thing I would love for you to, to mention also in passing is, or not, um, is that you are working, you received a very large fellowship. Is, uh, is it a fellowship a or is it a grant? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a residency with a grant. Residency, attached. excuse me, a residency. So could you talk a little bit about yeah. that for my students and, and how, like, if you applied for this? And so, you know, one of the things sure. I just want to add really quickly, one of the things that constantly happens every year in, in the drama department is that there are scholarships available for students and they they don't apply for them and money goes unused and, un, you know, and, 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 and I'm really trying to encourage, go for it, go for it. Yeah. So how did you go for it? And what is this? And um, 
Yes. <laughs> uh, well, so um, this came from, you know, like uh, a relationship that I have with uh, the Fusebox Festival and Ron Berry, who is an incredible human being, who's like, who, like I said, supported Futurex for a very long time. And not only in terms of donating money, but also like I was able to really talk with him about how he created the Fusebox Festival. Fusebox Festival, if you don't know, is an amazing festival of avant-garde performance here in Austin. Usually a lot of mixed media performance, um, a lot of it wonderfully bizarre, wonderfully innovative. Um, and uh, and he's uh, really taking it on to, to diversify the festival in the past, you know, I would say five years or more. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, um, and so he uh, reached out to me because he was partnering with uh, Texas Performing Arts. Um, they were partnering to um, uh, donate money to uh, create this artist residency, all right? Which means that we will get a certain chunk of money uh, to develop artwork with Texas Performing Arts and with Fusebox um, to be presented over the course of a year. And uh, he said, look, they're looking to sponsor local artists of color do you know anyone and I, <laughs> yes i do um I'm, I'm really well acquainted with one um, um i wake and, up every morning <laughs> yeah exactly and, and i mean and to me i think that that's something that's really important for for young artists to realize is that you do have to advocate for yourself you know and you have to become comfortable and and i think that what you need to then do is say all right what are the ethics of me advocating for myself in these situations? Oh, that's a question you ask yourself. <laughs> I do. I do. Oh, sure. um, wow. Good question. You no. Know, um, and so, and, and what I wanted to do was um, you know, thinking about Fusebox, there's a project that I'd had in my head for a minute about um, that. This, this is a project like so many good ones. It was an idea that I had with Jesus Valles while we were both on the bus together uh, randomly. <laughs> Uh, we were not we were not headed to the same location, but we were on the bus together. Uh, and so um, so uh, we started talking and joking about the the rural trilogy of the playwright Federico Garcia Lorca. Federico mm. Lorca was a Spanish playwright in the early 20th century. And uh, he has written, he wrote many works and so his three most well known are what's called the rural trilogy, meaning a trilogy about people in like village life in Spain and it's Blood Wedding and Yerma and uh, the house of Bernarda Alba as are their names in, in English. And- um, I love Lorca. Yeah, it's like- <laughs> enormous, and, um, enormous love. Yeah, and so um, so we were started joking about like taking these, these very emotional, tragic um, pieces that sort of like I would call them lyric realism, you know, they're sort of like realism, but then they have these sort of fantastical moments or these surrealist moments. Um, and making them into Mexican comedies. Um, and so we started joking about them and coming up with lines and coming up with like bits. And that idea planted itself in my head and never left. And so I thought, well, this feels like a fuse box piece. It feels like something that's going to be weird and avant-garde and fun and and wild. Uh, and so I said, well, what I would love to do is I would love to reach out to Jesus and two other playwrights with whom I, well, two other playwrights whom I love. I've only worked with one of them so far before this residency. Um, so Jesus Valles, like I said, performer and poet here in Austin. Krista Gonzalez, uh, she is an actress and playwright in Los Angeles who lived in Austin for many years. And we produced her play Mascara for the second Futurex Festival. Um, and then uh, Victor Casares, who contributed some film to the first festival. Um, and he is an incredible playwright based in Portland, but um, who is uh, right now producing work in New with New York Theater Workshop where mm. he has residency. Um, and so I said, I'd like for us to work on this trilogy of plays together and uh, create, you know, like spend the year basically writing these and developing these plays. And so uh, Fusebox and Texas Performing Arts both said that sounds exactly like what we want to do. Mm -hmm. And so I got the grant and um, it means that like, it, what it means is that the three of us, the four of us, the four of us, the three playwrights and me, um, we will all be paid at least some money for the work that we're doing, you know? And and that's huge, to, it's yes. huge to develop, you know, to say yes. that, that 
before your play even goes up, we're going to pay you to work on the creation process. The labor, the yeah, labor of exactly. the, pro the process of creating yeah. this stuff. It just doesn't and come out of thin air. Exactly. You know? Yeah. It's like, you know, and, and it's, we think that like, you know, there's, there's the, the feeling that we have often that creative work is, um, is not labor, but it is. And yeah. uh, it, it takes, it takes time. It takes um, like emotional and intellectual work. Um, it takes a lot. And so being able to legitimize that, particularly for artists of color, I think is very important. Um, and uh, and again, with, with Jesus, uh, Krista and Victor, like they are artists who bring in their perspectives as artists of color. Krista is Afro-Latina. Um, all of them identify as having indigenous heritage. Um, so like that's, those things are going to inform these plays in a new way. Mm -hmm. And um, that they're also all identify as queer in one way or the other. And so that's those, the queerness of these plays. And Federico Garcia Loca himself was um, a gay playwright. Um, and you know, we, we, the thing that, that Victor said that I think really kind of came down to our, our center of, of the idea is that, you know, we are, that Lorca was a queer writer who lived through a pandemic, the, the, the flu of 1918, and who lost his life under fascism, mm -hmm. um, the rise of fascism in Spain. We are a group of queer Latinx artists trying to survive a pandemic, trying to survive the rise of fascism in our country. And so what are the things that we, that, that Lorca can say to us and we can say to Lorca through these works? Um, yeah. That is such a precious thing to say for my students in particular, because with their assignments, um, one of them, they have a choice to do a dramaturgical assignment. The question I always ask is, why this play now? Yep. Why? You know, um, theater does not live in a bubble. Theater is in conversation with um, the issues of our time. And um uh, remixing, remaking, revamping, re-queering uh, theater even is something that um, it's, it, in my mind, it's it's limitless. And that's why we continue to stay um, in this uh, wild profession right now, because many of our um, comrades in art are suffering from lack of space and lack of ability to perform because of COVID. And I do remind my students of this, that uh, let's all be a little gentle to our to our performing artists right now who are grieving um, on multiple levels and um, politically suffering as well as um, <laughs> medically suffering. Um, and, and we're trying to be safe as artists and uh, at a time in which art really needs to be loud. Yes. Isn't that interesting? So how we're getting these messages across for uh, to promote equity, to promote um, the hidden histories of how we got to where we are now. I think that art is the channel for it. And um, whatever uh, I can do and whatever students can do or anyone involved, um, if, if you think you're on the sidelines of these artistic practices, uh, I beg to differ and students have an opportunity now to be a part of um, the Futurex that Rudy is coordinating, planning and um, the artists involved could use your attendance, could use your presence, even if it's a digital presence, it would mean a lot and it would also generate some generative thought for for the audiences, for you, for the students, to to see what's extremely contemporary right now. This is new work that you would be seeing, new work from living artists that are creating these pieces in conversation with the national, if not global, dialogue. Yeah, yeah, and you can, and you know, for for those of you who are like interested, you know, first of all, um, you know, we do give out free tickets every night at 7 p.m. So like check the website to see how we're doing that. Um, you, you have to contact the box office directly, I think either by phone or email, but you can get 
uh, in for free. Um, although, of course, we do love if you would be able to, to contribute the fifteen dollars. Um, if you got the money, um, every every artist in the the United States is is worried right now about their continued um, uh, health, safety, uh, ability to pay their bills, um, and the ability for the spaces to remain in operation. Right. Um, and um, but also, you know, like there's there's uh, you can go into this thing and you can get there's there's fortune telling happening <laughs> uh, various nights uh, with loteria cards, uh, queer loteria cards, of course. Um, there's um, you know there's there's so there's there's DJ DJing happening, uh, so you can hear music. You know there's uh, a life coaching session uh, happening with Coach Ben Bazan, who is a a delightful human being. Um, and so uh, the experience you're gonna get, and the, the fact also that the formatting is such that like you, you go onto this online page and you're clicking at points on this labyrinth and you don't necessarily know what you're gonna get. you know. So you're gonna click on that link and you're gonna be surprised by what you're gonna see. And so uh, we would love for uh, folks to, even if you think that, oh, this isn't my kind of thing, you're gonna find at least one thing on there that is. Take a chance, take a risk, watch something new, see something new, hear something new, and you never know. That's the whole point of uh, being artistic explorers um, and, and students, actually. So <laughs> the whole point of getting an education is to expand your boundaries and what you think you know. And sometimes you don't know what you don't know. So might as well... Uh, the risk is very low when you're online like this right now. So Absolutely. <laughs> no reason not to do it. Yeah. Um, so the website, I it's vortexrep.org and I will post that in all of the, 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 the things that you read on the screen uh, associated with this conversation with um, Rudy Ramirez. And I also want to, um, let students know that in the future, there are possibilities of, I'm sure, maybe you can speak to this, of volunteering for such festivals and being of help and of service. Or if there are ideas that perhaps a student might want to submit something that I'm sure that they would need to contact you, for example, or is there a website that they can go to if they're really interested in exploring this further? Um, well, what I would say is this, is I would say that um, you can follow us on social media. Um, look for uh, Avante Theater Project, which is the company that I've created that creates the festival as well as the Vortex. So Avante is A-V-A-N-T-E, Theater Project. Um, and theater R-E, because of like the pretentious spelling. Yes. Um, and uh, then the Vortex as well, um, you can follow us. Uh, but also uh, you can reach out to the Vortex directly and say, I'm interested in volunteering. I'm interested in like being in touch with uh, folks from Futurex. Um, you know, if you contact us on Facebook, we are usually quick to answer. Um, if you're interested in volunteering, especially if you're interested in volunteering, um, and uh, and so there's lots of ways to do that, and uh, lots of ways to and you know, I'm always happy to hear a cool idea, um, and uh, and if you think, oh, this is too weird, then it's probably the one I'm going to pick. <laughs> Um, well, thank you so much for your time. I, um, I think that this will be of great benefit to the students, but I, uh, I also want to encourage, I think I'm going to submit this for the ACC as this digital green room, and um, this would be really good material for that as well. Uh, and I think everyone should uh, make an attempt to be a part of FutureX as a, as a as a viewer as somebody as an engaged audience member and uh, and be on the lookout for this project uh, that Rudy was speaking of earlier that um, that he, he's literally working on right now so we'll probably get word of that in the next couple of months about what to see for that so you heard it here first the, the seedlings of, of this uh, project. And it's all about the future <laughs> in development. It begins here and now. So thank you so much, Rudy. Is there anything else you'd like to add before I um, click um, stop uh, recording? <laughs> just, to, just to say thank you, Heather, so much for having me and for letting me talk about uh, the project. And, uh, and for all of y'all watching, uh, hope to see you there.